Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time. I don't know how busy these weeks and months now have been for you. So I'm really thankful for, for your time and for making the time to, to have this conversation. As you probably know, I've been doing these interviews to, to try to create an oral um, record of the things that we have been living in this uh, in these weeks. I really believe, as we all, that this is a before and after moment. And I, I thought that it was important to try to, to create these, these memories, right? For us to come back later on. So I would like to just get started by asking you to introduce yourself to people who do not know you, a little bit of your background, your personal background, your training, your institutional context, and very importantly, your social context, the students are, that you serve in, in your institution. Okay, sure. And first of all, thank you, because I, I think this is a very important. I, I'm glad you're doing this because you're right. I mean, as right now, I'm starting to forget what it was like, much less, you know, two years from now, I won't remember any of this or I'll have blocked it out. Um, so uh, my background is um, uh, I started out actually as a, as a biology major and I have a degree in marine environmental science. And a lot of people don't know that because I actually have spent my entire professional career in administration. And so I started out in institutional research and I eventually branched out into planning and from there uh, ended up working for a couple of institutions as basically the person who did accreditation, space planning, academic planning and institutional research. And I worked for 10 years at the Naval Postgraduate School which is in Monterey, California. And I've worked for the past um, six, six and a half years here at CSU Monterey Bay. And this last year, we unfortunately lost our provost to a much better and bigger position. And she's a chancellor now. And so um, I was given the opportunity to become the interim provost here. And it's been an amazing opportunity and an amazing challenge at the same time. It's a, it's a wonderful, opportunity to be able to grow. I, I always enjoy being able to grow in all of my positions that I've had. I don't know that you could have chosen a better time to step on that. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, and yeah, just to talk a little bit about what CSU Monterey Bay is, because for those who don't know, this is a CSU is a regional institution. There are 23 campuses in our system and we're one of them, and we're located in the central coast of California, literally on the coast. You can walk uh, half a mile downhill from this building that's behind me, and you'll be at the beach. And so the, um, the Monterey Bay dominates a lot of what we do. We have a very strong marine science program, but the CSUs, and in particular Monterey Bay, are dedicated to students who, um, who come from disadvantaged backgrounds, who come from backgrounds that perhaps they did not have opportunities. Our students are the students who are using education as a way of leveraging up from more disadvantaged, poorer backgrounds to get ahead economically and socially. And this is a, a mission that resonates with me very strongly because my, I actually have an immigrant background as well. My parents are both uh, immigrants from many generations back. So it's completely different generation, but um, I'm you know, a first generation American myself. So, um, so using education, my father had a grade school education. Using education as a way of moving up in the world is, is very resonant with me. And so a lot of our students do that. And it's, uh, we provide, and, and, I, and I want to you know, um, emphasize that we, we have, we, we have a high quality education here. I know sometimes people think state institutions, they take in anybody and they don't, they don't have high quality, but that's not true. We have, your own department has tremendous scholars in it. We have a very fine marine science program, as I mentioned, computer science, business. We have a, a really well-rounded program here and our students go on to big and better things. So it's, it's a really wonderful mission to have. So a typical family from, from CSU Monterey Bay uh, like an average family, you have students from all different walks of life, right? But uh, when you think about families, what, what comes to mind? Well, you know, 
um, especially when we're talking about our local families, and we have a draw here. Our freshmen tend to come from Southern California, but our transfer students tend to come from the local community here. And when you're talking about our students, you're talking about families, many of whom are first generation uh, students themselves, many of whom started out in their families speaking uh, not English as their primary language, but and many of them speak Spanish as their primary first language, or they have parents or grandparents who primarily speak Spanish or another language. So that's a very typical kind of family for us. And we do have a, a good number of students whose families work in the fields, who work in, you know, um, those kinds of labor intensive mm -hmm. activities. And, and so their children many times are the first ones coming into the university. And we also have a very high percentage of our students who are dependent on financial aid and Pell Grants. So we're, we're yeah. very much a, not a wealthy community here. Yeah. Um, so you're beginning beginning a typical busy semester with searches and all these these things going on, and then COVID nineteen happens. <laughs> so, how was the experience for you? Well, it's interesting. I think back on it. You know, I think very at the very beginning. I'm remembering back to January. You know, when things were first starting to come out, mm -hmm. and we. We still were in this this mindset of, you know, it's no worse than the flu. This is just another version of the flu. It's going to come. It's going to go. Yeah. They're making a big deal out of nothing. And as the weeks went on, it became clearer and clearer that this wasn't nothing. That this was different than just the flu. That this was going to be considerably more impactful. And even then, we weren't we weren't positive about the extent of it. I remember when the when the county, the Monterey County, locked down, put us into shelter in place. And um, we all thought, it'll be a couple of weeks and we'll be back. Nothing to it, right? Oh, <laughs> so, so many of us just took enough materials for a couple of weeks worth of work. Um, we didn't think about setting up our homes as offices. We didn't think of any of those practical things. And... Um, and so that was that was like my first recollection of, of what we were dealing with. Um, and one of the things I will tell you about this, the ongoing challenge, even now, is the intense amount of, of uncertainty. That's, yeah. that's part of it. Um, as we worked at an institution, you know, most institutions have plans for how they're going to deal with emergencies. Mm -hmm. You have an emergency operations center. You've got plans laid out. But a lot of times the thought process around it is about a, a point in time. So like if we had an earthquake, we would have it and then we would move on. Yes, there would be aftershocks, but it wouldn't be, you know, there would be this major event and then we'd move on from there. This is very different. There, it doesn't, it doesn't stop. You don't move on. You sit there and you, you track case numbers and you track deaths and you worry about you know what's going to happen and you try to figure out how do you plan when when you have no idea what's going to happen so it's a very difficult and different situation to be in administration in these times. Oh, yeah. 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 so um towards uh, the middle of march right that's when the university had to had to close so, so what are the pieces that are moving for you what are the decisions that you have to start making those days aside from sending us all to go home go Leave home. Your <laughs> well you know first of all one of the decisions we had to figure out was how are we going to deal with the fact that we're asking the faculty to basically most of them didn't teach virtual we're a face-to-face -face campus primarily and so what kind of time, you know, how can we figure out a reasonable way to address the need for faculty to take some time and figure out what to do with their courses, at the same time, give our students the opportunity to finish their term, to get their credits. So, so those were, there were those decisions early on, trying to figure out, and we ended up closing basically for a Friday plus the following whole week. So that faculty, we weren't closed, closed, the students weren't in classes, but um, the faculty had the opportunity to start working on converting their classes. And again, they didn't know how long we were going to do this. We're still in the, oh, it's going to be two-week mode in our head. 
Yeah. So, so those were some of the decisions we started making. We started having to think about, um, you know, how would we deal with the students who were in residence halls? They had to suddenly have to social distance. How are we going to do this on campus? What was going to be open? What had to close right away? Um, I think for us, I will mention that for, for me, the, the one very tough, tough part about this was understanding how much we had to communicate. And again, that partly is, you know, it, things were changing, sometimes on an hourly basis, sometimes certainly on a daily basis. And you were trying to always keep up with the communication. And it was so hard to make sure you communicated with everybody. You send something out to a student and you have to remember, hey, the faculty need to know about this too because the students will come to the faculty. Yeah. And so you have to try and catch up and sometimes you'd fail. And sometimes you'd go, oh, darn, we didn't get it out to the faculty. Okay, let's catch up with that. And so communication was very, very difficult. And if there's anything as I think about and, and write up the next plans for the next you know, crisis we deal with, Dealing with communication is number one on my list. It's not great. Uh, yeah, because you need to provide not just uh, not just connect with the right people, but the frequency of it. Because if you give too much, it can become chaotic, and if you give too little, then people will get anxious. And so it's. I think the emotional component of all of this um, weighs bigly, right, in in the things that we do. Yes, yes. And, and that was another thing, you know, the other, the other part that we had to remember, again, it, it, it's different from a point of time impact like an earthquake. This, with its ongoing nature, impacted our students and our faculty in so many ways. You know, people having to care for children because the school's closed or, you know, students having to be at home and away from campus. We're primarily a residential campus. So, um, you know, students suddenly having to be sheltering in place at home with potentially siblings and parents and where do they find space to study? There were a lot of emotional impacts. This was tough for people to deal with. It wasn't, it wasn't just business as usual. It wasn't, it wasn't simple in any way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, in terms of uh, uh, preparedness, how, how well prepared do you feel your institution was to cope with it? I think we were, I think we were pretty well prepared. I mean, we already had an emergency team that, that had been set up for law for many years. So we have an emergency operations center and we're connected in to the county. So that had already be, been in place for years. And we were well connected immediately to the county health officer. We were very fortunate that I want to say Within the last year, we had hired a very excellent risk manager. That function proved to be extremely important. So we were really well positioned. And I think, I think, you know, a lot of it, a lot of it, as I say, was this learning experience of, of having to deal with something with the uncertainty. That was the part. And it's tough to deal with uncertainty no matter what you do, no matter how well prepared you are, because of course. You can't be prepared for uncertainty by its very nature. It's it's not, not possible. So um, I, I think just, you know, dealing with a virus was different because, you know, like if you have, you have an earthquake, you have a hurricane, you have a, a storm, you don't have to worry about things like disinfecting. You don't have to worry about things like people not being in contact with each other. And in fact, those very things, that's, that's, I think, another big part of this is that we're really realizing how much people need to contact people. We really need that, that personal contact. And if you were in the middle of a, uh, you know, after a hurricane, you'd be able to come over and hug your neighbors and hug your students. And you'd be able to, you can't do that. You can't no. touch them. You can't go no. near them. No. It's, it's very difficult. Yeah. 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 So if you don't mind, uh, I'm me asking um, how's your everyday life changed because now your staff is not next to you you're you're, you're confined and how did you manage that? how did your everyday life change well i'll tell you um i i, I don't want to i don't want to diss on zoom because obviously it's it's helped us a lot be able to connect and keep connected but it is exhausting um you do find yourself you know all of a sudden where a phone call 
or an email would have been enough. People keep wanting to Zoom all the time. And, and when you have a day, like, especially during the semester, like right now my life is calming down, the semester is finished, you know, grades are in, we're really starting to get into the summertime, faculty are off contract, it's, it's very much calmer. Um, but in the heat of the semester, especially during the, you know, during the, the peak of the COVID crisis, there were all these extra meetings added on top of all of the normal activities. So we had to try and run the university in its normal way on top of all of this COVID meeting and all this planning and, and doing. And so there would be many days when, you know, you'd start at 7 or 7.30 with a Zoom meeting and you wouldn't finish until 6 or 7 at night. And there'd be Zoom meetings one after another. And nobody says, you know, oh, I need to walk from building A to building B because you don't. You're right here. Mm -hmm. and, and so... You know, at some point you go, I've been in six hours of Zoom meetings today or seven hours. I'm tired. I don't want to do this anymore. Um, and, it, and it's interesting because it's it's weird. It's like when you know somebody already, it's not too bad. Talking to people who are complete strangers on Zoom is a little more difficult because you can't make a mental connection to the person mm -hmm. that you're talking to. But it's also so much more intimate. Like you and I, like I'm looking at your face right now and I can see it so clearly and so closely. But if you and I were in a meeting on campus, we'd be across the room from one another, you know, and there'd be a, a group of people, right? So, so in a personal sense, it can be very draining. Um, but at the same time, and, and, it, and it's one of those things where you feel like, you know, when do I have time to get the work done? Because <laughs> I'm so busy <laughs> being. So... You, you learn you learn to adjust and fortunately um, you do put in a lot of just like you would do um, in a normal work situation where you have regular standing meetings I never gave up my standing meetings mm -hmm. and so I met with staff on a regular basis and you also one of the things I think that we did do that was really important to us was that we didn't do this immediately which which I would change if we were going to ever go through this again but but uh, somewhere around April-ish, you know, we started doing more, and by we, I mean the president and some members of the cabinet, we do it with different groups. We would do large open town halls on Zoom with students, with faculty, with staff. And I, and I think that really helped a lot. But again, it's all more stuff that you've got to do. Yeah, and you find the time, and all of that is sitting in front of a desk, probably in front of a computer. Yeah. Our eyes. It, right. You know, it's like it took me a while. I mean, it kind of took me a while to say, why am I so tired all the time? And I realized that, you know, in a normal day, I would be at my computer for a little bit. Then I would walk over to my table and I would have a meeting with somebody. And my days were meetings. And so I would have lots of one on ones or meetings with groups. And I would walk to some place or, you know, I would move around a lot. And this is a very confining activity. There's no place. There's no place to go. You don't need to go anywhere. And yeah. so it really was important to to make sure that you take care of mind and body and get out. Some, you know, it's like I was grateful that shelter in place did not prevent us from getting out and walking and you know doing those kinds of things just to relieve the mind. Yeah. So you have, um, I don't know, probably eighty percent of your courses were face to face, if not more. I'm not sure what are the numbers. And about in two 90, weeks, ninety-three. Yeah. So I knew it was really, really high the number. And so in two weeks comes the realization to all of us. It dawns on us. This is this is gonna stay. How did the transition transition this semester happen? Did it go well? Did did the students? Uh, did the faculty carry on in good ways? How do you assess the semester? Uh, second half of the semester. Well, it was a challenge. I won't say it wasn't. I think the faculty really rose to the challenge. I mean, the reports that I've gotten, um, the faculty really stepped up. God bless them. They did. They did a really uh, an amazing job. Really put out a tremendous amount of work. Our faculty are very dedicated to students. You know, their their hearts and souls are with the students and student success. Now, you know, and it's, and it's, I'm going to tell you in reality, it's mixed, you know, it's like, what, what can you do in five days or six days as you try to turn? Yes, a lot of it was, you know, Zoom sessions and so forth. And, um, and some of our students struggled, 
as I said, some of our students and some of the faculty, you know, if they had children they suddenly had to take care of, how do they deal with that as they're trying to do their classes? How do you keep a quiet environment so that you can, you know, uh, Zoom with students? And just the whole thing of getting used to Zoom, most of us hadn't Zoomed all that much, you know, yeah. <laughs> so it's like, and even now, I am not a Zoom expert. So when somebody will mention, oh, you know, you know, it's like, it's a Blackboard feature, and I'm like, it's a Blackboard feature? No, a Whiteboard feature. Zoom, I'm like, really, there's a Whiteboard feature? How do you <laughs> like, oh, okay. Um, and learning the differences, you know, oh, you can do a webinar, you can do, you know, you can do 300 people in the Zoom meeting, and I'm like, We've had 300 people in town halls. It's quite amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and so yeah, so so the faculty had to figure all that out. Um, we do have an amazing um, center for academic technology. They were there helping. We have our teaching, learning, and assessment folks. They were in there helping. Yeah. And our students, I know, reported mixed. You know, some of our students, you know, could acclimate very easily. Some of our students really struggled. Um, yeah. A lot of our students, they really need that face-to-face, -face, um, that face-to-face -face contact. They really need a concentrated kind of environment when you're in a classroom. You don't have distraction as much when you're in a classroom. You're there with the teacher. It's a very different thing when you've got pets and children and siblings. Oh, yeah. Around. yeah. How about the digital divide? Did, did we have uh, problems with uh, students having uh, issues with accessing the sessions and connectivity and all of those issues that we take for granted oftentimes? Oh, yes, absolutely. So especially because Monterey County has, it, it's a very large county. The, the areas that are urban in Monterey are very concentrated kind of in the northern part of the county. And then the county itself stretches out into rural and farming communities for a long distance. And a lot of those rural and farming communities and mountainous areas have very little internet connection. And so we had to had to try to figure out how we could get our students connectivity. So we loaned out hotspots. We bought a number of hotspots for students, loaned them out. We lo had to loan them out to faculty as well. Not all the mm -hmm. faculty had good connection. Um, we tried to make sure that um, we did some upgrading to the, um, we have a local residence area that the institution owns where a lot of the faculty live. Uh, it's called East Campus, and we did as much as we could to upgrade the internet there. We had loaner computers for people who had no computers. So we had to kind of do that, you know, as best we could during that semester. And so now, as we're getting ready for the fall, we're continuing to think about how we can even further upgrade. What can we do to improve that yeah. situation? Because it's it's still out there. Our students don't all have access to computers, or or they don't all have access to their own computer. They might have one computer in the house and everybody. Uses it. So mm -hmm. it's it's not that it's not that easy, you know. It's like we're we tend to think we're all very digital, and the reality is that a lot of our students are digital put on a phone. And it's right. not really easy to do a class on a phone. So it doesn't it, work well. Yeah. It doesn't. Um, as you know, I have to. I, I need to keep this these conversations to a certain length, and, and this is just so fascinating. I, I can lose track of time easily. But I, I really. <laughs> I, I don't want to close without getting a little bit of your perspective. I, you know, I'm enthusiastic about how challenging this time has been for one and one reason only, and it's that I can see opportunity to revisit the things that we have done, thinking that that's the only way to, to visualize opportunities for, for new ways of engaging with students, for ways of solving issues that we have had uh, persistently in the past, for even the, the footprint that we exert institutionally on our communities. So I, I would like to get a little bit of your perspective on it as an educator, as a, a pedagogist, as an, as an administrator. What did you see as the main challenges and the main opportunities that we have? Are there things that we can, that you see changing in the future that we can adopt as, okay, this was good. This wasn't that bad after all, right? Yes, I can. And I think, I, I think I've talked a good deal about some of the challenges we faced, um, you know, in terms of connectivity, in terms of, you know, doing the transition. A lot of that was our immediate challenge. The challenge as we go forward and the CSU as a system and CSUMB as a campus 
have committed to a fall semester that is going to be primarily virtual. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, because we believe that we're not through this COVID crisis and that, um, that our students are better served in a virtual environment right now. So as we go forward, we're going to be looking, some of the challenges will be what I just mentioned about making sure that we've got enough um, technical capacity for both students and faculty. And we're working towards that in terms of getting more machines and finding interesting ways. It's, it's interesting, it's opened up some ways of thinking that maybe we we wouldn't have we wouldn't have had to go to. So, for example, our IT people are looking into ways that students can use a regular, you know, web connection, a regular browser connection, and access a computer and use the software that's sitting on a computer in an empty lab at CSUMB and be able to do their work by mm -hmm. remotely controlling that computer. We never would have thought of that. Why would why would we have done such a thing? Um, I think the future is going to show us that we can utilize some of those kinds of opportunities. We can be a little bit more technologically based than we've been. I think we're we're headed towards a place where we're likely to be more hybrid because our students and our faculty and as people, we still want that connectivity. And there are some things that you can't do without being in a face to face environment. For example, we're not holding scuba classes this fall because you can't do that. In a remote, it's, it's kind of tough to, to do a remote scuba instruction. Um, but on the other hand, um, the, the, the power of the computer, first of all, I think it's going to give our students an experience that will help them in the future. Our world is only going to go more technology. Mm -hmm. It's only going to be more and more, you know, technological, and you're going to have to use these tools, and you're going to have to get along and understand how to work in that environment. And so, this I think is a good base experience for our students. It's it's a challenge for some, and I know not everybody likes it, but to understand it and to know that it's something that a challenge you can meet, I think, will be important. From an administrative standpoint. This is going to give us the opportunity to expand our student population without having to expand our facilities, which is really critical in the times when budgets are tight and it's difficult and a long, it's a, it's a huge, long process to build a building. So like the building behind me, our library, that's now I think 10 or 12 years old. Um, and, and it's not easy. We've had now two more buildings built since that one was built not easy to build buildings, but if you have the ability to put, take one classroom and put two classes in it for every time period, that's an, ex that's an expansion. You know, Monday you're doing you're doing face to face, Wednesday you do virtual. And I also think it's going to help transform just even how we teach because faculty will get, you know, um, and we're doing a, a summer institute right now for our faculty to help them expand their horizons, learn a little bit more about different techniques one can do, how you don't have to always be synchronous, you can do teaching asynchronously, and I think it's going to expand just our whole pedagogy, just the way in which we teach, the way in which we approach students. It's going to be a, a bigger blend of things, and we're going to be looking to do, have, have you know, students doing more in that, that outside the classroom part and coming into the classroom doing more interaction. That's just one of the ways that I think things will change. Exactly. It's, it's wonderful to think that we can come out of this strengthening in, in many ways after going through yes. very difficult times, absolutely. Yes. Fran, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. This has been a pleasure of a conversation and, and I look forward to continuing our interaction in the future. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome.